Okay, good morning, everyone. It's good to be together again, new week. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Just thank the Lord for His grace. You know, week after week we meet and we study together. It is God's grace upon our lives. So let's just thank the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for this new week that you have blessed us with, the God. We thank you for your mercies that are new every morning, for your grace upon each of our lives, for the ability to learn, to grow, to develop ourselves, O God. Lord, even as we look forward to this week and this class, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will speak to us, you will speak in us and through us, O God. Lord, we just uh, submit this time, even as we learn, uh, we pray, God, that you will empower us, you will strengthen us, you will anoint us for your purposes, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, how's everyone doing? Good? Okay, Okay. so last class we did um, chapter 8 and we looked at very important points on understanding and understand and reason. And we looked at the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, right? Let's just do a quick review. I know a few of uh, last class, there was a little bit of a confusion, uh, but maybe some of you have missed the class. The recording is available. You can listen to it. But let me just do a quick review, and then we'll, uh, we didn't complete this chapter. We stopped in between, so let's try and complete this and get into chapter 9 as well. Okay, so understanding and reasoning. And this is what the Apostle Paul did, right? In Acts chapter 17, Paul goes into... Uh, Athens, right? In his second missionary journey, he goes into Athens and we look at two things. Who are the two kinds of people in Athens? Epicurean and Stoic. Right? So there are these two kinds of people. Both had their own belief system. But their belief systems were different, yet it was not in nowhere close to what the Bible or uh, according to the you know what the Bible teaches. So the Epicureans believed that everything in this world is from God, and in the end, pleasure is the end of everything. The Stoics believe one day we will die, we will, you know, God is a big fire, one day we will die, and we'll unite with that fire. So the Apostle Paul has gone to that place, and he's sharing about the gospel. Yesterday, on Sunday, we looked at the power of the gospel, right? So he's sharing about the gospel. It was something that was unique, it was something that they have never heard in their life, yet they said, hey, Paul, we want to hear you again. So you come to this main council, right? the main place where all these political decisions and all these reasonings and arguments and everything is resolved in this place. So you come to the center of the city and you speak to us. right? And so we picked up some points on how the Apostle Paul spoke to the the people who are listening to him, right? Let's look at those few points. It's all in Acts chapter 20, 17 onwards, right? First thing that he did was he said in Acts 17, 22, he said, you are very religious. So what did Paul do? He didn't condemn them. He said, hey, you all are all very religious. You are searching for a God. When I walk around, I see that you've written, you've got a temple and you've got a statue which says to an unknown God. So you are very religious. He didn't condemn. Two, he used something to relate and to understand with them. That is, That became a starting point. So what did he say? See, I see that you have a statue saying an unknown God. Now, let me explain to you what this unknown God is or who this unknown God is. And he begins to share the gospel. Thirdly, he says, Acts 17, 28, some of your own poets have said, for we are his offsprings. So this was very, I think this was the most powerful impact that would have happened to those who are hearing. Because for the Epicureans and the Stoics, God was just somebody outside this world, outside in the cosmos, right? A fire. Now their own poets are saying, we are his offspring. So if God is a fire, then we also must be a fire. If God is a statue, then we also must be a statue. Offspring, you know the word offspring means? Uh, uh, a, uh, a resemblance of, right? We are offsprings of our parents, right? 
somewhere or the other we'll resemble our parents, like offsprings. So Paul is making an argument there and he says, your own poets have said that we are his offspring. Now, I'm not saying anything. Right? So here again, you see Paul is taking the safe place. Right? He's putting the ball in their court, meaning he's saying, your people, your community, your writers, your philosophers have written, we are God's offspring. So if you put a statue and say to an unknown God, how can we be God's offspring? So the third point is also to understand. So the Apostle Paul, he learned about the culture. He probably went back and read. What are these Athens all about? What are they doing? It's not like uh, Apostle Paul has gone there two, three times, visited the place, spent a holiday there, come back. No, it's the first time he's in Athens. There's no record of him going there ever, first time. And so he was able to make an effort to learn about their belief system. And thirdly, he moves, or fourthly, he moves into sharing the gospel. Right? So first thing, what does he do? He recognizes where they are in their spiritual aspect. They're all religious. Two, he says, I see a statue to an unknown God. What is unknown to you? Let me bring it to you. So what is he doing? He's got a starting point. Three, he says um, he made an effort to learn about their books and their philosophers. Four, he brings the gospel in. Talks about God's judgment, God's forgiveness, and how God can restore us. Um, and he shares the message of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what was the outcome? We saw two outcomes. First outcome was some of them mocked. Everyone say mocked. The word mocked means what nonsense you're talking. It's not making sense. Remember, the Athens are all philosophers, great learners. For them, if we die, become you know a fire and become a ball of fire, and that makes sense. But this does not make sense. Some of them criticized. What are you talking? One man came from heaven. He lived a good life. He had some disciples. Then he had to take all the sins of the world. So he took all the sins of the world. He put it on himself. And he willingly died on the cross. And if we believe in his death, we believe in his resurrection, we have eternal life. Does that make sense? doesn't make sense. So some of them, what they said, it's foolish. doesn't make sense at all. But the others, some of them believed. And some of them who believed were, were people who were in the, that congregation. So we're talking about leaders. There some of the, those who believe were political leaders. They believed. And it goes on at the end that few of them believed and they became a community of believers. A church was planted. How long all this took? You want to say a 10-minute sermon? Within 10 minutes. Right? Now, what is the what is the most important thing that I learned from this passage? Apostle Paul, he did not boast about his revelations. He did not boast about who he is. Does he? Now he's old man. He's an old man. He's almost, he's more than 50 years old. He's standing there, right? And he's talking. He didn't say, hey, you know what? I met Jesus. I was the commander of the temple guard. You ask me 10 questions in Judaism. I will answer all of them correctly. Then I will ask you questions. Let me see if you will answer. I know more than you. Was it true? Yes. Because it says that he was a learned man studied under Gamaliel, and he was commander of the temple guard. So he knows he was a strong man. He had so many things under him, but Paul does not boast about anything. Does he say anywhere, you know, I did this, I did this, I did this. He says, this is what it is. This is what the gospel is. Through the gospel, you will be saved. Right? So it's a very important learning. Yes, testimonies are important. Right? We share our testimonies. Many times people have asked me, why don't you share your testimony? 
testimonies can bring an encouragement. Oh, wow, you know, God has changed his life so he can change my life also. That's good. But the real change happens in the power of the gospel. That's the real change. Let's see, testimony, people will forget after one week. Right? After two weeks, they'll forget. After one month, they'll forget. Or maybe after a year, they'll forget. Because, you know, it's a testimony of somebody else. But when the gospel, when the message of Christ goes into us, we will not forget it. Towards the, even in our deathbed, we will remember the time somebody shared the gospel with us. Right? Maybe you are 10 years old, somebody shared the gospel in children's church. You become a believer. Now you're 100 years old, you're on the deathbed. Right? You're going to die any time. You will remember, hey, when I was 10 years old, I gave my life to Christ. What was the message? This Sunday school teacher said that, you know, when we are, we are all sinners, but Jesus died on the cross. And because of his death, we find forgiveness of sins. How many years later? 90 years later, in his deathbed, he's remembering that. That is the power of the gospel. And throughout those 90 years, he must have heard many testimonies. He must have forgotten many testimonies also. But his testimony will be true to himself. So very important lesson. Good to share testimony. We talked about it, right? Two-minute testimony, five-minute testimony, 10-minute testimony, all of that. But rely on sharing the gospel. And many times we may feel, I need to add something to this. It's very simple. It's too, it's too simple. God loved this world. He came into this world as a human being. He lived among us. He lived a holy life. He was crucified. He took up our sins. He resurrected on the third day. And now we live again. When we die, we will live again. It's too simple. Can we add something to it? Not required. That is more than enough. That's why Paul says, no, the message of the cross, it is foolishness to those who are perishing. It won't make sense to them. But for you and I, it is a gift of God. It is salvation. Right? So why is it that when you know people ask you, hey, why you believe in Jesus? Why is that conviction there? Because of the gospel, because of what Jesus did. Nobody can tell you, don't believe in Jesus. Even if they say, what will you say? I can't help it. I have to believe it. Show me proof. Where is Jesus? I don't know where is proof, but I know that the Bible tells me Jesus came into this world. From where that conviction came? We can look at our own selves and say, where, where? who told us? How many of you were unbelievers before? You were from another faith. Anyone here? You were from another faith. And there are so many people I meet who are from other faiths. Who told them? Who told them they can go back? Now? Why is it they're willing to give their life for this gospel? Have you ever thought of it? You know, sometimes we are all born in a Christian home. We see all those Bible verses everywhere. It's all common. Yes or no? I grew up in a Christian home. Everywhere there's Bible verses. But nothing I knew. It becomes common. But the reality sinks in when we, when we understand. Why is it that people right now also are willing to give their life for Jesus? And I saw one video recently. This video, uh, somebody shared it with me. This video, they, they, there's a Palestinian Christian. Okay. Uh, so a Palestinian Christian and the reporter is saying, if you don't, how can you believe in the Israel God, the God of Israel? First of all, Israel don't believe, many of them don't believe in Jesus, but the interviewer didn't do his study. So says, how can you believe in the God of Israel? So he's saying, that's not the God of Israel, that's my God. God has chosen me also. And they said uh, in the interview, he's saying, uh, you know, right now, if I call five people, they can come and kill you. So I call. And he's saying that, call. And the interview was shocked. So you're not afraid of your life. He's saying, no, I'm not afraid. Anyway, I'm going to die someday. 
But I'm worried. And that video is so powerful because the interviewer is also asking, do you have wife and children? He said, yeah, I have wife and children. Where are your children? They're in the school. So is it OK? You will not see your children again. He's saying, no, it will be painful. But I know that I know what Jesus did for me. So there's no way I can I can deny him. You see that who, who, who from where did that come? The power of the gospel, the message of the cross. And it's deep inside. Nobody in this world can take it up. Right? Anti-conversion bill can come. Any conversion bill, reversion bill, any bill, it doesn't matter. Any bill, let it come. The Bible says the gospel will only advance. Of course, we you know, yesterday we talked about this, that we change the way we you know minister to people. We change the way we reach out. But the gospel will only advance. Everyone say advance. The devil, what he wants to do? He wants to stop the church. So he'll do, he'll make you know little persecutions here and there. But the gospel will only advance, it will only grow. But what about people who are leaving Christianity? Five leave, 500 will come. That's how God works. 500 leave, 5,000 will come. 5,000 leave, 5 million will come. God is a God who's working, right? So his gospel is powerful. Let's look at a few insights. This is where we stopped last class, OK? A uh, few additional insights. Preach, the, preach Christ and his work on the cross understand reason but remember that reasoning alone cannot do everything right so when you're ministering to a hindu or a muslim or a person from another faith only reasoning will not you know do all the work reasoning is important what did paul do he reasoned with them then he brought the gospel in. he said this is what jesus did right do not get into meaningless arguments and debates. Right? Now, many times when we are communicating with people, ministering the gospel, it can become an argument. Tell me where Jesus said, I am, I am God. In the Bible, I am God. Where does Jesus say? So, you know, the people from other faiths will say, it's not there in the Bible. So many times I would get so upset. I'd say, what do you mean it's not there in the Bible? John 1, 1, in the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh. Who became flesh? You became flesh. Jesus, the word became flesh. Way later on in the end of Revelations, he says, the word was sitting. He's the word. He became flesh. And all through, Jesus himself was saying, hey, before Abraham was, I am. God tells Moses, if they ask who sent you, what do I say? Say, I am sent me. Right? And all through, what does Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the uh, you know, light of the world. I am this. I am before. Everything I am. So obvious. But where is it written? Jesus saying, I am God. So many times, you know. But sometimes it, when it gets into meaningless debates, see, there are times people will only want to debate. They only want to talk. They don't want to, their mind is not open. They just want to, OK, tell me. I will tell you back. They have something or the other. Their mind is closed. Now, we must understand. We must you know, have this ability to you know, be able to look at people and when you're talking to them to decide, is it the right time to go ahead or not? What did Paul do? Ten minutes, he preached. He shared the gospel. And he finished. Probably he would have said, OK, I am done. And after the, he was done, he said, people criticized and sneered at him. Nobody interrupted him. Ten minutes, shared. So don't get into meaningless arguments and debates. Debate is good. But when it's getting into an argument, stop. Let's move on. Right? Everyone with me? OK, let's look at this. Understanding Hindus and Muslims. Now, living in, a, in India, 
how many of you have Hindus and Muslims as friends? All of us. If you don't have, make friends. Don't don't be people who say, oh, I'll be only in with Jesus. I'll sit on Jesus' lap. No, don't do all that. God said, Jesus said, go into this world. I'm sending you into this world, right? So be open to people. Be open to uh, meeting with people, right? Points to emphasize while speaking with a Hindu, right? Now, for example, you there's a there's a Hindu, a friend you have, and he's your childhood friend, your good friends, right? Now, how? What are some of the ways that you can minister to this person? Maybe he's lived in your colony from the time you're five years old, and even now you're friends with that person, right? So, how can you minister to them? Right? Now, he's your best friend. He's a good friend. But we need to be careful how you will minister, right? So let's look at a few points. First one, point out the existence of sin and evil. Now, the Bible talks about sin, evil, death, all of that, right? Now, look at what Hinduism talks about. Karma and reincarnation, right? What is karma? If you do good in this life, when you die, you'll become someone better in your next life right karma is you do good to me good will happen to you right reincarnation that is if you if i if i if i have done very good if i've given to the poor if i have looked after my parents i've lived a good life i've gone done all the sacrifices done everything offerings and all of that i've done Right? I've been a good person. So next life, instead of becoming an animal, I'll become something better. Right? I'll go next level. Now, if you go deeper into Hinduism, you have different, right? The Kshatriyas, the Vaidyas, and the Shudras, and all of those things. Right? So they believe that you know, when you're born, you're born in one of those three sects. Right? The Kshatriyas are the highest, uh, the Brahmins, and then the uh, who are part of the Kshatriyas, the Vaidyas, and then the uh, Sudras, who are the lowest. And, and so for them, you're going up to the level. You, you die, you, have a good, you live a good life, reincarnation. Now, how can you bring out the gospel? One thing you can ask is, how do you know your sins are forgiven? Have you ever asked that to a Hindu? So we all sin. The Hindu will say yes. Do we all, are we all evil? They'll say yes. Because they believe it. Right? Now, so you and I are sinners. So how do I know that my sins are forgiven? So the Hindu will say, I go to you know, these places of worship. I do what I have to do. And I give sacrifices, I offer things, I, I, I do all the offerings, and I come back, and I know that God will forgive me. They will say that, right? OK. Now, next follow-up question you can ask is, that means you're getting forgiveness through your own works. So the more you work, the more God will forgive you. They'll say yes. Now comes your question. So let me tell you about why, what we believe in. I'm also a sinner, just like you, just like me. I'm not very holy. I'm also a sinner. But when God saw my sin, he knew that this sin cannot be taken on by my own self. So that is why God had to become man to identify with me and to take up my sins on the cross. So now I know I am forgiven. And I'm not coming by my work, but I'm coming by the work that Jesus did. So you see the difference here? Now, while we are saying this, many questions may come to our mind. Will he understand? Will he understand? Don't worry. Because what you're doing, you're sharing the gospel. Right? It's the gospel what you're sharing. And it's the power of God. It may go into his mind, and when it goes into his heart, he can become a believer. Okay? Two, 
we talk about forgiveness contrasted with karma and reincarnation right so again it's not by the works that we do when we you know in hinduism there's there's a lot of things that uh, that that they do to obtain forgiveness i'm sure you know about it kneeling and walking up the steps rolling on you know uh, walking on fire walking on, so many things right and these are all done for forgiveness god forgive me otherwise i'll hit myself i'll beat myself I'll go through all of this but in christianity it's so wonderful that forgiveness is through the blood of jesus so you can say hey I'm forgiven not because I climbed up this hundred steps or walked on salt and walked on fire. I'm forgiven because what because of what Jesus did. My by myself I cannot be forgiven. Even if I hire a aircraft and go around the world two times, I cannot be forgiven. By myself, it's not possible. But through the blood of Jesus, I find forgiveness. So these words, right? Forgiveness evil sin use these words when you're sharing purposely use it sometimes we feel we feel that they may not know no they know they know they would have heard it when you talk about sin anyone will know it evil anyone will know forgiveness anyone will know it so you bring out these words word choices are very important when ministering to people Okay, three, when you talk about um, to Hindus, Christ contrasted with many avatars, meaning now when you look, when you read about Hinduism, you see that there are many avatars, right? Meaning many, um, uh, many gods and goddesses. And this one God, portrays himself in many avatars, right? In, uh, I would also say, many positions or many kinds of gods. That's what Hinduism is. So in Christianity, Christ is the most unique. Tell me, who is, in which religion has a person Come, he has lived and resurrected again. No religion. Right? Now, the way you put it across is very important. Right? And now imagine you're speaking to a Hindu. You don't say, okay, tell me where is uh, where is your God? Tell me. He fell in the water and he's gone. My Jesus walked on the water. <laughs> That's the wrong way to, to bring it out, right? Now you gotta listen, you gotta learn how to put it. What is Christ's uniqueness? If you look through history, does history prove that these gods and goddesses lived? Is there a historical proof? There's no historical proof. Does history prove that Jesus is Jesus lived? Was Jesus uh, just some person who lived in the sky? There was a person, okay, whether he's God or no, that is secondary. There was a person named Jesus. He lived during the Roman century, Roman government. There was a man named Jesus. Who is Jesus? He was the son of Joseph and Mary. Where does he live? He lived, he was born in Bethlehem, lived in uh, Galilee, Jerusalem. There was a person named Jesus. So even Romans, uh, Gentiles have written that there is a man named Jesus. You cannot change that. So that's historical proof. There is historical proof that Jesus died on the cross. Roman philosophers have written Jesus died on the cross. When they write their books, no, they've written there was a man named Jesus. He died on the cross. Now, whether he took up the sins of the world, all that is secondary. But did he die on the cross? Yes. So you've got history to back you up. Okay, so this is my history. And history proves that Jesus was taken and put, that he died and he was put into the tomb. History is proving. And history also proves, because some of your own writers, the Romans and the Greeks have written, that his body was not seen. 
after three days. It is not there. It is impossible to steal a body. Can four or five people come carry Jesus' body and go? You know, the Roman in, around the tomb, there was a Roman centurion, right? If you see, what is century? What is century? 100 years. Okay, 100. A Roman centurion. You know how many soldiers were there around that tomb? At least about 100 soldiers. So you're saying the disciples went hiding, opened the tomb, in front of about 100 soldiers guarding that tomb. Right. But anyways, what we're trying to say is look at the uniqueness of Christ. Bring it out. The world says when somebody hits you, hit them back. But Jesus said, somebody hits you, show the other cheek. Hey, what's unique about this? In the world, leadership means to stand and to tell people what to do. But Jesus is saying, if you're a leader, you become a servant. You wash your, wash your feet. Your leader should wash the servant's feet. But in other religions, the servants wash the leader's feet. What is so unique about Jesus? You bring it out. Right? Everyone with me? Right? Bring out his, his nature, his attributes, and who he is. Right? He was sinless. He was perfect. And he came and he did a perfect work. And then, fourthly, uh, he is a loving God seeking personal relationship rather than, uh, you know, just by self-effort. Now, when you look at Buddhism, Hinduism, and other religions, they want to obtain this thing called um, Nirvana. How many of you know what's Nirvana? Nirvana means a place of complete rest and peace. So what do they do? They pack up their bags, everything. They go into the mountains, and they sit in the mountain and begin to meditate. Why? They want to attain that place of perfect peace away from the world, right? Now, they do that by their own efforts. It may take five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. They're still sitting in the mountain in, in quietness. Why? Because they want that perfect peace. But look at Jesus. He's, he wants a relationship with us. God is putting his hand out and saying, I want to have a relationship with you. It's not like we are using our own effort and saying, God, where are you? God, where are you? I want this peace. No, God is stretching out his hand and he's saying, I want to have a personal relationship with you. So what does that mean? There is no other religion that has, that God has a personal relationship with you and me. There's no other religion. In Hinduism, no. In Islam, no. That's why it's, uh, people who are, uh, you know, Muslims get very upset with uh, us as believers. Why? How can you be friends with God? Who are you? You're nothing. You're a human being. How can you have a relationship with God? No. It's not possible. They don't understand that it's not we that is reaching out. God is reaching out to us. When we try to reach out, we will fail. That's what happened in the Old Testament. They're trying to reach God. God said, it's time I reach out to the, my people. Right? So when we talk to them, think about all this. Right? You can have a personal relationship with God. And finally, um, Christ's power to transform an individual life uh, versus engaging with self-actualization, -actual self-realization, and self-discipline. Now. Self-discipline, self-governing, uh, you know, all of this is important. But as believers, you and I depend on Christ's power. We are disciplined. We live a good life, a holy life, not by our own strength. We are depending on God's power. But here, it's more about self. I must do it. I must get well. I must prepare myself. If I do it, everything will be right with me. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you look at it, you'll be depending on yourself. 
And so if you become prosperous and famous and successful, because I did it. But here in Christianity, God may make us prosperous, successful, big businessmen, you know, doing great things. What do we say? It is by, hopefully, we'll say it's by God's grace. God's grace. But here, I did it. I am the one who woke up early morning. I am the one who worked 10 years constantly, you know, 12 hour shift every day. That is why now I am the CEO of the company. And the believer here is saying, I worked hard, but it is not me, it is the grace of God. You see the difference? Right? Both put in 12 hours, both put in a lot of effort. One is saying, because I did it. One is saying, it's the grace of God. So that's the difference. Christ's power to transform and change our lives. Secondly, let's look at how so a few points to emphasize while speaking to a Muslim. Everyone with me? OK. Now, if you go deep into Islam, uh, you know, Islam has, after the ninth, towards the 10th century, Islam has two sects within them, right? Uh, one is the Shia Muslims and one is the Sunni Muslims. That's not in your notes. You'll learn more when we in the next semester, right? So there are the Muslims who are, you know, very strong in their faith. There are some that are, okay, you know, I, I don't have to do this, right? Just like Christians. I don't have to go to church on Sundays. Once a month is all right. Same way, there are Muslims. I don't have to go to the mosque on Friday. Once a month is all right. But you have some of them who go every day. So there are different kinds of people in different kinds of levels. Each Muslim is different. Find out. So find out what they believe. Because not all Muslims believe in the same thing. right? As I said, when Islam was founded, later on they became two sects. And okay, think about it in Christianity. right? There are some who believe in speaking in tongues. So there are some who don't believe in speaking in tongues. There are some who believe in miracles. There are some who don't believe in miracles. There are some who believe in the rapture. There are a few of them who don't believe in the rapture. There are a few of them who believe in the, you know, the judgment seat of Christ. Some of them, they don't believe in the judgment seat of Christ. Right? So there, there are differences. So always find out what kind of person, what, what, what is his belief system. Right? Now, if you ask a Muslim, hey, what do you believe in? Just generally, what do you believe in? He's not going to get angry and say, I'll put you to jail. He's not going to say that. He will say what he believes in. It's a very simple question. Right? You're not saying believe in. But all you're saying is, hey, what do you believe in? It could be a stranger. I can ask you, what, what is your belief system? Then he will share. And then you will get to understand, OK, this person is a religious person. Or you may find, hey, uh, you know, you may ask somebody else, hey, what do you believe in? Uh, I, I don't know. My parents are Muslim. I'm also a Muslim, but I don't really go to, um, you know, on Friday prayers. I don't really follow all of that. Only few festivals I go to. Apart from that, I don't know much. So you know, OK. This other person is, he knows, he's religious. He, he's going to Friday church, Friday you know, prayers, and he knows. But this other person does not believe. So you know how to enter in right, in a wise way. So let's look at a few points on how um, the traditional Muslim and the modern Muslims, their two belief systems, how we can reach out to them. OK? Number one. Establish genuine friendship. Very, very important. Now, I do understand there will be times you're on, the, you know, you're meeting somebody, but you cannot, you know, establish a friendship. You're just meeting them for maybe 10, 15 minutes. Right? So that is a, a time when you just try to share as much as you can, just uh, given the gospel in a very powerful way, just and then trust the Lord to work in their life. Right? The seed is sown. You've done your part. But in places where you can build friendships, establish friendships. How many of you have heard of Nabil Qureshi? 
Yeah, he was a he is a very famous uh, Muslim, right? Now he had a friend named David Wood, and they were very close friends. Now David Wood was a very strong Christian, very strong Christian. Nabil Qureshi was a very strong Muslim, but they were very close friends. Okay, the religion did not, you know, uh, separate them. So in his testimony, you know, he says, we were always learning more and more. David Wood will study the word and he will try to come up with all kinds of things to share, right? Not condemning, but sharing about the Bible. And Nabil Qureshi will try all he can to prove the Bible wrong. So this went on for four months, five months, six months. And almost one year down the line, right? Nabil Qureshi could not find anything wrong in the Bible. He could not find anything wrong. He could not prove anything to David Wood, his friend. How do I find something wrong in this? But David Wood is going on finding many things wrong. And we keep telling him. So this man, Nabil, said, I need to think about this now. Right? So he began to spend more time in the word, in God's word, in the Bible. Right? And what started as a as a way of you know uh, bringing the gospel of of winning an argument or winning a debate, he turned out to become a believer. Now this is these one-off times where nobody preached the gospel to him. Nobody preached to him and said, "You believe in Jesus." Nothing. All he did was he read the Bible and he said, I could not find anything wrong. I could not prove him wrong. David Wood, in the end, David Wood baptizes him. What a baptized uh, this man. How genuine friendship. Establish that. It could be with a Hindu, with a Muslim, with people from other faiths. Establish that friendship. Gain their trust. Now, it's not like you're. Uh, you know, trying to you know gain trust and then deceive them. You're not trying to do that. Gain their trust in a sense that hey, whatever I do, uh, let me be true to God's word, true to what I say. Right? Three things that we would normally question, uh, that Muslims would normally question. Number one, whether Christ is Lord. That's the number one question. How can God become man? It is blasphemy. It is impossible. You're saying God became man. So for them, it is too much. They believe Jesus is a prophet. They believe what he is and what the miracles that he did. You know, the Quran itself says he was a proper, great, the greatest prophet. The only woman mentioned in the Quran is Mary. The only woman mentioned. Right? So, we believe a lot of things, but is Christ God? They will never believe it. It's a question mark for them, always. Two, whether he died on the cross. Now, the Muslims believe that when Jesus was on the cross, he may not have died. He may have, you know, recovered from his physical uh, illness and may not have died on the cross. Or it was somebody else who died on the cross. Different belief systems. And three is whether he rose from the dead. These are the three main questions a Muslim will ask. Whether Jesus is God. Two, whether he died on the cross. Three, whether he resurrected from the dead. Now, how can you and I counter these questions? If I am a Muslim, for example, I'm a, I'm a Muslim now. I'm asking. How do you know Jesus died on the cross? What will you say? Anyone would like to share? How do you know Jesus died on the cross? Or how do you know Jesus is God? What can we say? You're saying Jesus is God. Came into this world. Right? How do you know Jesus is God? What is the proof? That you have. What can we say? 
is written in the Bible, okay? But the Bible is not. It's good. It's written in the Bible, but how do you know the Bible is true? Pastor, can I say something? Yes, go ahead. Pastor, uh, Jesus Christ is the only, uh, I mean, prophet among all the other religions that he died and he was resurrected and he appeared to uh, 500 people. He was after resurrection for 40 days on earth. And there is evidence with his apostles, the first people with him. Okay. So basically, first hand, uh, uh, first-hand witnesses, right? Even Poro, Poromita writes historical proof that says, okay, that Jesus was a person. Right? Yes, we can bring out all of this, but what 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 is something that we can always say is, right? Uh, number one point, how do you know that Jesus is Lord? Number one, you bring out historical proof, saying there was a man named Jesus, and this is uh, historical proof. Two, you bring out his deity. As a man, he walked on water. As a, there's historical proof for that. So what you said is written in the Bible. So you got to establish the fact that the Bible is not just somebody's writing. It's history also. Is there a place named, uh, uh, you know, what is Gog and Magog? You've seen that in the Old Testament. That's Russia. Right? So these it's not just a book where you know an angel came and said you write no history is there in this there's, there's history in this when you look at Daniel and the revelations he talks about uh, Alexander the Great right? so there's many there's history so you prove first that this Bible is also a historical book right as it is a spiritual book and when you establish that you're able to bring in this point that Jesus is God because in he was a man, but as a man, he also did these things, which nobody has done. Right? Two, whether he died on the cross, again, you've established it. Right? History proves it. People, eyewitnesses, as Gertrude said, eyewitnesses have seen it. Romans, Gentiles, Jews, everyone has seen it. History attains to it. And then whether he rose from the dead. So even as you bring this out, right? I'll bring it out in clarity. Now, remember, when you share, there are times you cannot, uh, you know, the reaction from the person who's listening is not under your control. You cannot say you have to believe what I'm saying. No, it's not under your control. If they believe or no, that's up to them. But you're doing the part of sharing the gospel with clarity right let's just look at a few things here the nature of god uh, he's a god who is um, loving a loving creator god uh, and he's a god who wants to have a relationship with us but for the muslims he is not uh, a god who is a loving god he's a god who's uh, of more of vengeance and anger right uh, i'll just take a minute uh, right at this finish this sin for a Muslim, sin can affect only people and not God. For a Christian, sin not only affects the sinner, but it affects our relationship with God. Then there's forgiveness. Now, for a Muslim, we know that they go to Hajj. The Hajj is a place which they go to every year, and they perform all these sacrifices for forgiveness. Again, by works. But here, in, in Christianity, we don't come by works. We come just the way we are, and we find forgiveness through the cross. Then we see the fatherhood of God. In Islam, uh, the relationship between God and man is, is more than that of potentiate and subject that between the father and son. So again, the relationship, a father and son relationship, it's not there in Islam, but it's there in Christianity. Paul writes, he says, through his spirit, we call out our Father. And finally, the Christian life is a life of faith, a life of a walk of love written by God's word. We be, be obedient to God's word. And, um, and then we are led by the Holy Spirit. But in Islam, it is fatwa, which means it is a list of rules that we must follow. 
right? Legal opinions uh, and and a lot of uh, inter learned interpretations that you have to follow to attain this place of holiness. Again, you see the contrast between works and God's grace, right? So we'll stop here um, and we'll get into the next chapter nine, next class. But what I want you to do is uh, just take time, right, uh, to learn and read about other religions. It'll help you to share the gospel. Right? Thank you so much. Thank you to our online students. I'll see you next class.